Hi, my name is Sarah Comedina. I'm with Global News. Uh, just after looking at everything, a lot of people who I've talked to at the encampments talk about how they feel safe. They feel it's safer than a shelter. Um, and despite what we're seeing with the dangers of fire, drug use, um, and all kinds of activity, uh, just w what do you say to that when they're maintaining they just feel safer in these encampments? Well, I think there's a couple things. So I'll, I'll try to keep this organized as best I can. Um, the shelters are what they are. They are a, a place for a short stay for someone that might be out on the street uh, that needs a warm bed, a meal, and a place to sleep for the night with four walls around it. Um, there are standards that, are, uh, that the, the shelters have to follow. And for the most part, um, we're finding that they do. Right, they are, they they clean daily. Um, there's there's security on site. There's appropriate staffing, and they have those ratios that have to meet. So those shelters kind of abide by those standards. I think in some cases there is challenges in some of the individuals that are are experiencing homelessness that have to use shelters. They have complex complex needs. So there are some barriers that we're conscious of and we're trying to figure out how to navigate. You may have someone that's living on the street that has a pet that can't go into the shelter or they've been previously banned or they're, they're in a relationship with somebody else that can go, can't go into the shelter. And I know that some of, the, some of our partners are looking at how do they accommodate those special needs and, and provide, let's call it flexible shelter options for people that need them. There is also a unique dynamic that we're finding is that there are rules and there are, there are things that people need to abide by when they're using the shelter system. And in a lot of cases, they're not willing to do that. So when we see that people uh, have addictions issue, want to use their drugs, and they're not allowed to use it in the shelter, they won't use the shelter system. Um, I, I want to I give an example where we had an incident, uh, Boyle Macaulay, a couple months ago, where two individuals came in, both had knives, and there was a fight, and one of the guys was, was stabbed with a knife. And uh, I think what's important to note with that is they weren't screened going in, and, some, and I don't want to use that, that as a primary example, but again, that's where screening and some of that kind of oversight becomes important because you know, we want to create not only a safe environment out on the street, but as well within the shelters. So I think a lot of it comes down to people are not willing to abide by the rules within there. When it comes to the situation at the eighth high-risk encampment today, um, I'm not sure if any progress has been made within the last hour, uh, but the plan was to dismantle that encampment. Um, what kind of challenges are you finding with, uh, with people arriving to support those who don't want to leave? Well, it obviously enables and empowers people not to leave those sites. And one of the things that we bank on and that we depend on within the notification process is that compliance ahead of time that they'll leave the site. Right? So we give people within the opportunity to leave and that's part of why we give that advance notice. Um, now this is starting to become one of those where it becomes oppositional and people will become more entrenched and that creates problems for us because now not only are we dealing with what we've shown as some of the risks and some of the hazards within the encampments, is now we have to consider do people get arrested out of there and that's not where we want to go with this. But at the same time, you know, we're going to have to look at how do we approach these in the future and how do we restrict access to everybody so we can get the job done. The province of Alberta is talking about uh, a program they call compassionate intervention, which would be a mechanism to get people who refuse to leave but are a danger to themselves and to others to get to for force them to leave, to force them to leave. Um, how, would that be helpful in terms of um, dealing with these camps? I, I think it would, um, from what I know of the proposed act. And uh, I'll, I'll kind of give an example here. We, we now run, and I think some have heard about it, our integrated care centre. We've converted our old detention management unit in our old police headquarters into an integrated care centre. So people that can't care for themselves, that need supports, can go there rather than jail. We have actually support workers in there that are helping to people navigate out of what they're on. And we're finding about 30% of the people there gravitate to help. But the other 70% just go back to the street, right? So how do we start to compel that other that other group of people, that larger group of people to get help. And in some cases, if they don't want it, from what I know of the Compassionate Intervention Act, is that they're now people can step in to try to, to force that. I've often heard people say that people don't want help. I think it's the statement is people don't know they need help at this point. So how do we motivate that? Um, there's a press release today, uh, Janice or one of the NDP and other people signed it, and they accused uh, the police of treating the people that were being removed as trash. What do you, and we saw on social media also some really negative portrayals of the police officers involved in clearing up the camps. What do you think of that allegation and that kind of um, framing of the police and the people doing this work? Well, I would say it's not accurate. 
And I would say it's wrong, and, and, and in no way are our members going into these sites and being malicious. Uh, we're not destroying property like that. Um, we are trying to be as collaborative as, and compassionate and negotiate with individuals in the encampment every single time. And uh, I think anything else is, is a bold-faced lie. It's, uh, we are not going in with the intention to just up, upend and dis displace people without care and concern. And we, we approach these very compassionately. So I'm not sure, Mike, if you want to add. So. Even add to that. <clears throat> so I've been on. Sorry, I've been on site for um, six of the seven uh, completed closures uh, that are being discussed here, and um, the compassion that my members are showing is above and beyond reproach, including the uh, most recent sudden death where the over the male overdosed in the tent. My males or my members stood by while that male's property was gathered and. Um, a offering was made to the deceased person. So my members go above and beyond every day to make sure that we are trying our best to approach each closure with compassion and empathy. Amanda Anderson, CTV. You've managed to close, I guess, seven of the um, high-risk encampments, but we're already starting to see the camps popping up nearby. So, I mean, how successful is this at creating better spaces, getting people into shelters? So, this is a great question. Uh, I think we struggle with this every time. Um, the alternative is doing nothing, and I'm not, I know that's not the answer. But I think that I'll go back to what I said is at some point we have to understand um, the dynamics of these encampments, continue to keep the pressure on it, uh, as a collective, as a group, not just from the police service, but as a city, as a, as a partnership, as a whole, so that we incentivize people to look elsewhere. Uh, Re-encampment or, or uh, repopulation of these encampments is a big consideration. We're trying to figure out how to deal with that. In some cases, uh, and I don't want to get into the tactics, what we're considering, but it may be changing the environment so they can't set up. Uh, continue pressure and enforcement within those areas to, to motivate people not to come back. But it is an extreme challenge that we're faced with. And, uh, you know... You mentioned, and, and it, I reflect, you say seven of the eight encampments, like, again, I'll go back to our presentation, there's 750 high-risk encampments out there that we've got to respond to. So it, it makes it very challenging because within each one of those, there's that, that chance or risk of repopulation. So I'm not sure if you have anything to add, Mike, but. <clears throat> no, and, and that's, it all goes back to that balanced approach that we're trying to do. So a lot of what we hear from different outreach teams is they need more time to connect with a person with different um, service, whatever that may be. So we are always trying to balance that approach and how we are responding to each encampment. So including on an individual basis. So we work with different teams, uh, with, with individuals to say, uh, they can stay on a site longer if needed, or we can connect them a little bit faster if their location's about to be moved. And we'll actually foster those relationships and keep those conversations going as much as we can. And again, it's just that balanced approach of trying to uh, connect as many people as we can with the appropriate resources in the appropriate time. And then I know we got a lot of information just prior to this, but can you give us sort of an overview, just a quick overview in terms of um, what the risks are, um, what you've been seeing, it just like I said, an overview, and also the risk that um, it, people like yourselves, your, your agency and everybody that's responding to close down these encampments, uh, what risks you face when the notice is given, um, i.e. the booby, booby traps. You wanna? Yeah. Thanks. So um, we're routinely faced with um, open flames and open fires within encampments, and I appreciate that that is a source for people to keep heat, keep warm, heat, and cook food in some cases. However, the uh, reality of having an open flame within an encampment is it's simply not safe. Uh, it's labeled right inside a tent that it's not a uh, open flames are not suitable within that structure. So when my members are responding, when first responders are responding, when outreach are responding, the chance of an explosion is very real, and you saw that in the videos. And that shrapnel from a, even a one pound propane tank can travel hundreds of feet and cause some serious injury. So it is a real, very real concern on a daily basis. And that's a one pound propane bo bottle. You can imagine a 20 or 100 pound bottle if that was to go off. Um, not only it's the the toxic toxic fumes that we're encountering. So folks will burn everything that they can find in some cases. In some cases, that's stuff that should never be burnt. And members are putting themselves into a situation where they're putting their faces into an encampment to check on their welfare and, in, and being exposed to um, all sorts of toxins within that smoke. Other things that we see is um, knives are common. 
within within an encampment. It's almost a given that there'll be a knife within an, any encampment. Uh, bear spray is common. Um, there's also uh, concerns with uh, replica firearms and real firearms as well. I think too, some of the other risks come from some of the biohazard on scene. Uh, we know the discarded needles are a risk uh, to to our members, to to the cleanup crews, and then just to the public maybe walking through those areas. Um, and I don't want to also uh, overlook the fact that you know with some of the drugs that we're seeing on the street right now, whether they're the fentanyls, the xylenes, those are extremely toxic just to be in the air. And um, we thankfully we haven't had. Uh, that I know of anything within our encampment teams, anybody being exposure, but the risk of that is real, to be exposed to those to those chemicals and having uh, an unintentional uh, impact on somebody. So. And also, sorry, the risk of yeah. um, giving notice and, and yeah. drops, that sort of thing, the hardening. That's a great question. Thank you. Uh, so, you know, we know that we're trying to give 24 to 48 hours uh, notice uh, to individuals within encampments, but that creates starting to create real officer safety risks in terms of hardening of those targets. Um, we're seeing, uh, and, and Mike has talked about, Michael's talked about it here, the uh, some of the booby traps that we've seen in some of the encampments, and those pose real risks again to our officers, to the cleanup crew, uh, and I would even say just the general public that may come across an abandoned camp where one of those uh, things may exist. So. And I can add a real life example to yeah, that. Yeah. <clears throat> so uh, just uh, three weeks ago, there was a report of a booby trap. Uh, complaint came in from a citizen riding his bike along the river valley. And uh, that male had been knocked off his bicycle by a neck level height of wire strap between two trees across a bike trail. So thank God that this male had his head turned down on his bike helmet and that's what caught the, the wire. He was riding at a good speed on a bike. So very real uh, threat and very real potential for injury, not only for first responders, but for citizens trying to enjoy the River Valley as well. Hi, Cindy Tran with the Edmonton Journal. Uh, following up on what one of my colleagues had just mentioned is that the the encampments are constantly reoccurring. And with that, we're seeing, as you mentioned, it's very polarizing on both ends. So how long can this work continue, especially if there's a need to rethink how you're able to redirect those living in encampments? Like how long can this go for? It's costing, I assume, a lot and a lot of time and also a lot of mental capacity for those who are working on this. Well, I, I think one of the things we have to look at first off is... Um, we, we have created permanent high-risk encampment teams because we know that this is going to be an ongoing problem, right? Um, I know that within the city budget, money was reallocated within the city to continue to do the high-risk encampment team work. So they recognize that this is going to be a prolonged event. Uh, we're actively engaging with our other partners to look at how do we respond differently? What are the things we can do differently? Uh, ultimately, what I would like to see um, is we're not going to change encampments the way they currently are is we create a different expectation about what camping looks like in the city of Edmonton. So we recognize that if people are still gonna be camping on the street, you know that they're clean, they're orderly, they clean them up at, at, during the daytime, which we see other jurisdictions have done, and, and we just create a different expectation and don't enable the behavior anymore, and I think that's a big part of it. To your point, I think we're, this will be an ongoing issue. Uh, we're not gonna solve the encampment problem as a whole. Uh, we know that addictions, we know that mental health is, is a big contributor to the people there. Those are things that need to be looked at. Again, I'll go back to what I said earlier, is we really have to focus on how do we incentivize people to be off the street and look to, for those services that are out there that can support them. Okay, shifting gears. Um, gang activity within encampments, that's nothing new. This is something that um, the force has said on multiple occasions. But when it comes to taxation of those public services that people need access for, um, is EPS able to do anything to prevent that from happening? Have you been able to deploy people to safe consumption sites, for example, where they are taxing people? Yeah. yeah, we have done that. I talked about the operation, we called it, uh, where it was where we would do operations around um, when we, people are getting their social assistance money because we recognize the, the risk. You saw the video. Um, that's a video that comes you know, through probab probably some operations. I don't want to get into the details. But we're focused on some of that gang activity. And, you know, the street-level gang uh, activity that's going on in Edmonton is, is challenging because, again, they're very much embedded within this in encampment population. Um, but we are focusing on that activity, and we know that uh, we're doing things, and, we, and uh, we know there's a need for suppression and disruption of activity, and we're focused on it. So I can't get into too many details, obviously, but, yeah. Hi, Natasha Reeb, CBC News. To follow up on the gang activity, who exactly are the gangs? 
Yeah, we've, we mentioned them, we talked about them. I think the Chief has mentioned those games. I'll let you go. Okay, my turn, I guess. Eh? Um, okay, so I think it's been noted in uh, some of the, uh, the, the, the media outlets and social media that the, the Red Alert Street Gang, the ASAP Street Gang, uh, it's no secret, uh, you know, they prey on vulnerable people. They've been operating um, for a long time in our city. Um, it's challenging, like the deputy said, because when they embed themselves in these encampments, not typical organized crime that we seem to focus on in the world that we live in in organized crime branches is they're operating in homes, in houses, with vehicles. This is street level. Try to get, a, get your finger on the pulse when it comes to this. It is very challenging. Then you also look at the victims that come out of this. Um, they're very reluctant to talk to us when they're victimized through this. Obviously, um, there's only so much we can do if they're not willing to talk, but I also see their side why they won't talk to us too as well. So um, those street level gangs are important. Um, we do have a guns and gang strategy that I know you've heard me talk about when it comes to the gun violence in the city. Um, we stood up that strategy really because we had an influx of gun violence, but when you look at stuff like this, it's all part and parcel why we have the strategy. So we set up a second gang suppression team. Um, we work closely with, you know, Staff Sergeant uh, Alex teams and the HSOC teams and tracks and our B teams. And if we see flare-ups like this and we identify issues, we have to refocus uh, those teams on these priorities. So you can see there's, there's, there's priorities all the time when it comes to organized crime and violence. And this is definitely one for us. So you know, having that second gang suppression team, uh, they, are our, they have the intelligence of who's operating, who's doing what in the city. Uh, so it is our job now to refocus those resources in the right places to deal with these individuals. I want you to say they're so embedded. You know, I'm trying to get a sense too. Do you know what's the ratio between gang members in these encampments? Do they live there or do they come and go? <clears throat> Yes, uh, they do both. So they're, it's very fluid in terms of how they're uh, embedded within the encampments. Um, we, we all see, uh, sometimes we'll see a high presence within a certain location uh, close to when they're receiving their assistance check. So we'll see uh, an influx around those times. And we'll also see members that are permanent but somewhat transit from location to location. So as Staff Sergeant Stewart alluded to, it's very difficult to get a real finger on the pulse of who's where and who's doing what exactly. But um, we do have good intelligence of, of who's in, within the space. But I know it's fluid like that, but is it clear to police who they are when you go to the camps? Sometimes no, uh, because the members are so fluid and so transient in terms of uh, their involvement within that space. And some folks will uh, say they're part of a certain organization when in fact they're not. Uh, they'll do that for very, very different reasons. So sometimes they'll say they're part of an organization or part of a street gang for the protection or the assumed protection of that or some of the, the street credibility or perceived street credibility, sometimes. Yeah, I think what's really important, especially with a lot of these gangs, they're not overly sophisticated uh, organizations. But what they make up for is the level of violence that they, that they use. And, they, they, and we do see, not only do they victimize you know, people within the encampments, the crime that's occurring on the street, the drug dealing, is they turn on themselves quite quickly. So they're, they're extremely ruthless, and I can say um, what they lack in sophistication, they make up for in violence. So. Hi, Carly Robinson with City News. I'm wondering if someone could just say on the record, uh, talk about the tech briefing we just had, why you had it, you mentioned a void, and why you decided to share those images with us. So. Thank you for that, and that's a great question. Um, one of the things that I really wanted to, to get through with the technical briefing was the information that we're faced with every day uh, in relation to the reality of the encampments. Um, the, the challenges that we face in terms of responding to criminal events um, and not being able to show some of that on an ongoing basis with the media has created a void. And I recognize that, and we felt it was appropriate to show this to you so you understand the depth and the complexity of the issues of what the encampments are in the city of Edmonton. I'll say within that tech briefing, these were not the one-offs. This was the norm, unfortunately. And we have reams and reams of, of that kind of data, whether it's pictures, video. And, um, you know, when you read in the media that, that 
they're safe. They're safer than the shelters. There's got to be better alternatives than what you've seen over the last hour. And uh, that was the real point was to get through. It's like, this is what we're talking about when we talk about it. It's not rhetoric. This is the actuality and the reality of the encampments and uh, what we're faced with and the challenges that we have uh, as, a, as a police service and as a partnership within the high-risk encampment teams in responding to and, and you know, suppressing this kind of activity and cleaning it up. So to the shelter spaces. We have new ones coming online today. Uh, the province just sent out a news release on that. What's being done from a policing perspective to keep those places safe? And is there more that needs to be done? Um, yeah. Yeah. So we're, we, we actively actually talk um, with some of the shelter providers and we've actually talked about putting, I'll say, satellite stations within there, um, encouraging our members to, to deal with that. I could tell you that within uh, Staff Sergeant Drylick's teams, that's the HSOC teams, uh, the other teams that are there, they are regularly responding to and going into the shelters to, to provide a police presence. So I think that that's an important aspect of this is that just having the social presence of police is mitigating and I think it's it's gotta keep going on. Um, you know, your question is, is there more that can be done? I think there's always more that can be done. And one thing though that I, I do recognize and I wanna just go back to the, the question about shelters is that we can't lose sight of what they are, right? They are a place, short-term place for people to stay for the night uh, that have need. And we know there are people on the street that have need and having those extra beds, I think will be a benefit to that. With uh, today's uh, encampment, uh, this delay, do you expect it to go into tomorrow, especially if there are people there, you have to um, consider that into what your next steps are. So like, where do you go from here? Well, I think um, we're gonna continue doing our job and uh, we're gonna continue to look at the high-risk encampments and we're gonna continue to work with the city on how we respond to them. I don't think it changes much for us other than now we may have to build in additional plans to deal with those kind of situations, but we're prepared for it. And, um, you know, it's not going to change what we have to do here, if that answers. So you don't expect this to go into tomorrow? For a uh, I believe it probably will. I think there's a couple things that are impacting today. It's obviously we have the reluctance to leave the site today. Um, we have to consider what are our authorities? Do we, are we looking at, you know, obstruction, those kind of things that we have to consider. We also do have weather. That's the first time that we've had to really deal with significant inclement weather, so we have snow, and that makes it very challenging as well. So there's a bunch of things that may impact um, responding to that camp. So, And I just wanted to ask, too, we have been hearing that there's been concerns with some of the dismantling of, of these encampments, that it's displaced some people into other areas, and that's seen disorder increase in other areas, um, and people scattering. Uh, I'm just wondering if that's something that police are also seeing as well. Yeah, we, we are seeing displacement. We see it with any kind of response to any kind of event, whether, whatever the crime may be. Um, so we always see displacement of crime and individuals through those kind of suppression or disruption activities. We know that uh, we're tracking all these. So that's what we keep asking is for people to keep, you know, calling 311 to add that information to the database because we're tracking it. And uh, it, as, as Sergeant uh, or Staff Sergeant Drylick was saying earlier, that helps us assess what's high risk and what's not. Um, you know, we, we, again, respond where we can to these high-risk encampments. Um, we are focused on displacement. Uh, outside of the high-risk encampment, we try to, you know, motivate and understand where our HSOC teams are, our beat teams, patrol teams, because they respond kind of daily as well to those kind of one-off complaints of that displacement. So if a, a camp shows up and we're getting calls, we're responding to them. So. Do you happen to have a number in terms of budget for clearing these encampments? Can you also speak to the resources? And you kind of touched on it uh, earlier, but with camps reappearing, is it worth the taxpayer dollars? Okay. Um, so I don't have the full budget piece. I don't have optics of that. And again, I think we have to recognize this is a city-led strategy. Right? From a police perspective, we've dedicated resources to this. So that's already within our current operating costs. You know, Staff Sergeant Drylick's teams, the high-risk encampment teams, those are members dedicated to that work. So there's no real above cost other than we're providing that service rather than other service. So it's a deferral of police services into high-risk encampment team work. Um, I don't have, I don't understand, I don't know what the city budget may look like, but it's likely significant. Um, your question though about, is it worth it to keep doing it? I believe it is. Um, 
I hope, again, the purpose of the last hour was to kind of show the challenges that we have, the weapons, uh, the criminality that's behind some of this, and the risk to the individuals, the occupants of these encampments, to our workers, I think to the public. So the question, if it's worth doing this, I believe it is. And if I can just, I mean, you, you, some very graphic ima images were shared. Um, you know, you, we've we've heard stories now of of deaths and some of the things that very graphic things that that officers and people that are responding to emergencies and different incidents at these camps have been seeing and the toll it's taken with two people off work. Can you just give us sort of an overview of that and why it was so important to get that side of it out so that people understand, I guess, what's happening daily in these places? I think it was important to get it out because I wanted and we wanted everybody to understand um, the impact to the, to the people that are living on the street and the risk that they, that they face daily um, from dying, whether it's from an overdose, whether it's from being in a fire in a tent or being victimized by somebody else. So there's extreme risk to them. So that's, that's important. We end up having to go to all that stuff, right? And that is, that is, I'm not saying it's a drain on the service, but you know, we've got multiple priorities and this seems to be a big, big focus for us. So is there other ways that we can get people out of these systems and out of these, what's, what's occurring to them so we don't have to respond to it? <clears throat> Um, I think it's also important because there is always kind of a concern that within the narrative that the, the high risk encampments are not high risk, that these are simply okay and there's, there's an opinion sometimes, I don't want to say it's enablement, that to support people living on the street. The reality is it's risky and it's dangerous. And, um, and I think that we will look back on this time and we'll wonder why, why we allowed this to occur to the depth that it did this entrenched encampment where people, significant amounts of people are at risk daily, so. I'm gonna throw one more out if, if I may. Um, and I don't know if I read too much into it. In the tech briefing, you'd use the term incentives um, to help people get out of that situation, get in, access services. Can you elaborate a little bit more on what an incentive might be? Well, I'll give an example maybe to contextualize it a bit. Um, we had responded to a high-risk encampment a couple of weeks ago, uh, the one along the LRT tracks. We, we were cleaning up there. And um, an individual came out of the tent right at the, at the beginning of the, uh, the encampment. And I saw that he had a, a wound on his hand, cut on his hand. And I asked him, went up to him and asked him, and how are you? And he was, he was good. It was a very cordial kind of conversation. And I asked him, I said, so what's going on? I'm like, why are you out here? And he responded to me, I was set up for housing. I lost my ID. And you know, what was the point? It was kind of the attitude. So when I talk about incentivizing people to, to get into services, right now the way it works is the services are there. There are, there are supports for people out there, whether, whatever they're faced, if it's homelessness, if there's addictions, if there's mental health issues out there, the supports are there. But right now it's on the individual to go, try to go find it and connect all the time. And that's the difficulty I think is that if someone living on the street, they're living rough, we're trying to push them to that, to that services. So how do we make that easier for them so that Maybe those services need to be collected in a hub. Maybe there's more opportunity for people to engage in those services. You know, I read an article this week in the media where an individual said he didn't even know there was shelter space because he just assumed by the amount of people camping on the street, he should be on the street. So how is that information getting to people that are out there that those support services are there? So when I say incentivize them, it's like, how do we get that available and make that readily available to everybody that's willing to engage in that? Um, just, you had mentioned, um, you know, we need to create a different expectation on encampments and that encampments won't completely go away. Uh, I'm wondering what other models you refer to other jurisdictions. Lots of people are, are talking about Halifax and what they're doing there. Um, is our police and the city, I know you have to work together on this, considering that model where you actually put those resources into, as you know, managing the tents themselves, heating them, uh, waste removal, all that, like managing these sites? Yeah, so <clears throat> what other jurisdictions have done <clears throat> is they have a uh, different shelter set up where there's actually drop-in centers and drop-in availability during the day. That would be a huge help in terms of what we can do differently. So the expectation is that folks, if they choose to live in an, an encampment during the night, or during the night, then by daytime they're picked up their stuff and they're gone into the drop-in center during the day. So that would be a huge shift in how we do things here within Edmonton, and especially with our, with our climate, that would be a huge help. So I'm talking about like the city itself, right, with mm -hmm. the help of you know managing, heating these tents, 
managing them, right? Not just the drop in part during the day, but like so it's that, a total shift in what Edmonton's doing now. So that's that's something that the city of Edmonton has looked into in terms of actually having like an organized site that you're referring to, um, and that's not something that the Edmonton Police Service would condone or support in terms of having that site because then someone has to actually manage it day to day and to own it. So it's not something you would support? That's not something that we would support, no. 